Hi guys, it's Alex from Forest Creative Films. So last, uh, last month I actually posted a video review of the OLED 55CX uh, and I got a lot of nice responses on it, so uh, thank you guys for that. And I also got a few questions. Uh, I figured it might be better to have a kind of question answer session to kind of answer some of those queries. The main one I got is that not many people have seen a review of the TV in a bright room. So as you can see, it's a beautiful day here in Rotterdam. It's about 25 degrees Celsius, sun is shining, and is a little bit of cloud cover. So I think it's a perfect environment to, uh, to actually show how it performs uh, in a bright environment. Uh, one thing that I personally realized is that if you have a lot of dark content, let's say you're watching Stranger Things or something like that, then having it in a bright room uh, can be a little bit off-putting sometimes, uh, especially during the darker scenes. But if you're just watching regular primetime TV or watching the news, then during the day it's absolutely fine. You don't have to draw the shades or anything. So we're going to get into that. I've also pre-ordered the new Sonos uh, Arc, and I'm going to do an audio review of the OLED 55CX compared with the Sonos Play Bar, compared with the Sonos Arc uh, when it gets launched. It gets released in Holland on June 10th, so expect an unboxing video on June 10th, and a review will probably follow a couple of days later. Anyways, so let's get into it, and let's take a look. house I have a uh, Philips Hue system set up. Uh, almost all our lights are Philips Hue lights and Anthony Ciro88 and Kennedy Espinoza was asking how to actually get the home IoT devices set up here in the home dashboard. So once you enter the home dashboard here on the right side there's an option for home IoT devices uh, and down here at the bottom if I'm connecting new lights for example to my home system I can click there and then it goes to other IoT devices it won't find anything new at the moment, but once I've connected, uh, it will ask me to press the button on the Philips Hue Hub, and after pressing the button, then it will connect instantly all my devices to the system. I do have to say, it's a little bit slow compared to using the, the standard Philips Hue app on my telephone, uh, but for quickly putting off and on some, some lights, for example, let's say I forget to put, uh, put off the lights in the bedroom, then here, I click, takes a moment to find it and send it through and it turns on. It also shows me the brightness and the color. So I can really change all the different settings straight away here on the screen. And I have to say, it's pretty handy to have it here just for those few moments when I don't actually want to go and find my phone or my iPad to go and change all that. So uh, yeah, the Philips Hue system is very, very easy to set up. It literally is one click operation and then pressing the button on the, on the, on the, on the hub. Um, so I'm quite satisfied with how it works. It just would be nice if it was a little bit quicker, but who knows, maybe with some new updates they can, uh, they can speed that up. So next, let's take a look at some upscaling. So Tom Michaels and Antcask, they asked to see actually how television performs on this device with upscaling. So here I have some live TV. This is via the DVB tuner. This content is 1080i, and as you can see, it looks pretty sharp and crispy. Sometimes I do notice a bit of artifacting. Uh, I'm not very happy with the signal that's being sent through by the cable company. It is digital TV, and what's nice is there actually is a decoder inside the TV itself, so I don't need to have any kind of extra card. And if I click Guide, here I get an overview of everything that's playing. It's very nice to have this actually built into the TV and not have to have any external uh, devices or to stick a card into the television. So I'm quite impressed with this and quite happy with how fast it is. I also have uh, KPN, so KPN actually provides television uh, via the regular internet network. So if we hop into that, 
Then we can compare the two. I have it set to HDMI 3. And my personal opinion, even though the bit rate is uh, supposed to be lower the KPN, it's around 7 megabits per second, whereas the digital TV is around 12 megabits per second, I do feel like this is a little sharper. The great thing about the KPN system is I'm actually able to change the uh, different resolutions. So let's hop into that. We can see if there's any big differences. So right now this is 1080p at 25 hertz, as opposed to the regular cable connection was 1080i at 50 hertz. I do find that this has a little bit more of a natural look. You can notice that the other one is very digital, whereas this uh, looks, looks very natural. So if we can also switch it to 1080p at 50 hertz, or leave it on automatic, let's try 1080p at 50 hertz. I do see straight away that it is a little, um, yeah, there's kind of a weird motion effect on it. I do have to say I'm much more a fan of the film look. So in Europe, on a PAL system, that's 25 frames per second. Um, in uh, America, that's 24 frames per second. So let's hop into some of the other resolutions. So we'll pop it down to 720p. So it still looks good, still looks sharp. You can notice that it's not as sharp as the 1080 was. And it's also possible to pump this way down to standard definition. So this is actually 576p. As you can see, it's become a lot uh, more blocky, the text. But I have to say, the image, it might be a little less bright. But overall, it looks, uh, it looks reasonably good. Now, it is possible to actually turn on uh, LG AI settings. So let's hop into the settings. And the LG AI settings, the big benefit from that is you can actually uh, turn on upscaling specifically for each HDMI channel. So if I go to uh, AI Picture Pro, this enhances the resolution and sharpness of contents by using an algorithm via the LG Deep Learning Technique and is optimized uh, for depth through content analysis. So we'll pop that on. Uh, while I'm on the AI screen, let me just talk a little bit about AI Brightness Control. So what this does is actually looks at the environment and changes the brightness of your TV based on the environment. Auto Genre Selection, I've turned off, uh, but this optimizes the uh, content uh, via AI again, based on the different uh, genre of the material that you're watching. I do find that this sometimes locks out uh, certain options. For example, if I'm using Dolby HDR and um, I'm trying to use the cinema mode, then for example, it will lock True Motion. So True Motion is the system from LG that automatically puts frames in between your, your content to make it, look, uh, make it look more fluid. For example, for sports, that's great but it's something that gets locked in the cinema settings uh, when you're watching cinema content. And I find that that really detracts from the viewing, uh, viewing experience. So by turning that off, you actually get more control over your system and you can change different little settings like that, like the true motion settings under Dolby for cinema. So this again, this is now using the upscaling. Just for reference, uh, it does look a bit sharper, I have to say. It looks, for example, I would compare it a little bit more with 720p material maybe 1080, but let's turn it off for a second while this uh, same image is playing and then we can see if there really is a difference. So we'll pop that off. Yeah, and you can see here in the faces, it definitely is way less sharp. You can really notice that it is not uh, HD content uh, anymore, whereas you can kind of emulate the HD content by turning on that AI setting. So let's turn it on one more time for reference. Yeah, his face is a lot sharper. You can really notice that the system works, uh, works pretty efficiently and doesn't create any artifacts in the image. All right, so now we've looked at different uh, frame rates, 
uh, and resolutions. Um, I think the nicest, nice thing to do now would be to jump into some, some old school content. So I've got my SNES Mini hooked up. It might be nice to actually take a look at some old school gaming platforms and see how they perform on the TV. Uh, since the LG TV does have three USB ports, I can power it straight from one of these USB ports here behind the screen. So, turn that on. There we go. Switch it to the correct HDMI port. Oh, I, that's the PlayStation. I have it on HDMI 1. Oh, by the way, if you haven't played Arabiz Supersonic, uh, this used to be one of my favorite games growing up. It's really amazing. Oh, that's something that might be interesting to actually take a look at some of the display settings. So we can put a CRT filter in there. We can have it 4x3, but I think it might be a nice idea to take a look at the Pixel Perfect setting. And then we'll get some Mario. Yeah, Super Mario World. And as you can see, the room is pretty bright and you can see some reflections in the dark content. But for general usage, I mean, it, it still looks pretty good. Wow, this really does look great. It looks sharp, it looks crispy. Yeah, this is, this is awesome. All right, so enough of my Mario skills. Let's hop into a little bit more content. Actually, one cool thing that I do want to show you guys before I move on from here, I'm just going to switch to the other camera. So here on the remote, it's actually possible to press one of these buttons to set this as a quick access channel. So right now I'm on HDMI 1 for the SNES, and if I hold down number 3, it asks me do I want to set HDMI 1 as quick access. If I select yes, then I can easily switch to the different HDMI ports based on how I've set it up. So you saw the quick access list pop up there on the left. Uh, number one I have set to the PlayStation, so if I go press number one, I go to the PlayStation. Number two I have set to TV, hold that down, and I go to my regular TV. And then number three is now set up to this NES. So this is one of the really handy little tips that I wanted to share with you guys. Um, it's really great to be able to have quick access, kind of like a speed dial for the uh, for old, old mobiles. Anyways, so let's move on to some other content. So I also got some questions about how I set up my Sonos Play Bar to work with the Magic Remote. Uh, so there is a trick to this. Uh, what I've seen online is generally um, you should set it to be a Philips Play Bar, but I, am, I have run into a couple of quirks. So right now I have it set to the optical audio out, and it's set up as a Philips device. If we go into the settings, what settings do I use? So optical connector, Bluetooth soundbar, Philips, and set for universal remote complete. So if we go, for example, and I, let's say I want to add a new device. Let's say my set-top box. It's set to HDMI 2. Oh, HDMI 3 then. So for the TV. It's going to find the different service providers here in the Netherlands. Uh, so this is a KPN box. And now to test it. It'll ask me to press a certain button, so we'll press um, the channel up. Uh, that worked. So yes. And done. So this is great. So now I can actually change the channels with my universal remote. But I do have a problem now. So now I have it connected both to the set-top box from KPN and I have it connected to the Sonos. But if now I want to change the audio, you can see that I'm getting a blocked symbol on the right side of the screen. Uh, this is a little bit annoying because I can't use the universal remote on multiple devices. And the only way to fix this is to actually go into the settings 
and decide what do I want to use it with. Now for me, uh, being able to control the sound from my remote, I don't mind having a second remote for my set-top box also because the second remote gives me a few more options with like playing TV back and things like that or watching recorded television that the universal remote doesn't support. So the, essentially the only way to get this to work again is to go back into the universal remote settings and remove the set-top box so that now I'm only using the optical Philips connection. And as you can see now when I'm changing the channel, I get, uh, I get that symbol in the, on the right side that shows me that the channel is changing. And if you look closely, you can see that now it's actually receiving it on the infrared sensor. This has to do with the fact that the Magic Remote doesn't send an infrared signal as standard. Uh, it uses some other technology. I believe it's a type of radar technology, uh, but don't quote me on that. But anyways, it's, uh, it's a different technology that they use to connect the uh, Magic Remote to the TV. So as we're talking about the soundbar, one other issue. As you can see, the TV looks great, great design, but it's very, very low to the ground. So when you're actually trying to use a soundbar in front of it, the soundbar tends to block the TV a little bit. The only two solutions that I'm thinking of is either putting the TV on a piece of wood, raising it up a little bit, or mounting it on the wall. So I think I'm going to wall mount this TV in the coming weeks. I'll also add a video about that when it's done. But it doesn't clear the Sonos Play Bar um, it doesn't really clear the Sonos play bar. But the, the one thing is when I'm watching a movie, for example, movies are very often letterboxed. So um, it hasn't really bothered me that much because it is such a large TV. Not a lot of content gets hidden behind there. Where it does get a little bit annoying is, for example, when I want to go into the home menu, underneath these different icons, when I scroll over them, you do see uh, some, some, some different information about them. Uh, for example, what you've actually selected, and that is hidden. So I have to sit up a little bit taller to actually see it properly. But for the most part, it hasn't really been bothering me, although I do want to raise the TV up a little bit so that, so that it clears the bar so I can see the, obviously the full TV in its full glory, including the bottom section. So thank you guys for watching. I've just started this channel, so it'd be really great if you guys could like and subscribe. It really helps out, especially in the beginning. Uh, so on June 10th, the new Sonos Arc will be released and I'll be comparing the Sonos Play Bar to the Sonos Arc to the internal audio from the TV. Um, I will also be doing an unboxing video on the day that, uh, that I receive it. It should also be on June 10th. And then the video review should be a few days later. So yeah, thanks a lot guys and uh, stay tuned.